when you look at a, a, a good place to put your savings, mm -hmm. um, and then if you have a long-term mindset and you care about other people, you care about the future, um, and then I believe if you look at the possible things that can happen in life, yeah, good and bad, I think a lot of us don't put, and we don't want to think about the bad things, but we don't, I don't think we put um, enough, maybe pro there's these things that aren't very probable, but if they happen, they're extremely volatile and very challenging. And so if you take a low probability with super huge impact, those things should be factored in. This is Better Wealth with Caleb Williams. David, welcome to the Better Wealth Podcast. Hey, hey, Caleb. Thank you. Good to see you. I'm I'm really excited for you to be on here. Um, in full full honesty, we did a recording a while ago and it got lost. <laughs> so um, you are this is part two, uh, and but people aren't going to listen to part one. And one of the reasons why you're you're on the the Better Wealth Podcast is you just have such an amazing testimony of what it's like to do legacy planning, what it's like to establish and assets, what it's like to take back control. You've been a learner. What makes you so unique is you're not helping people set this up, but yet you know so many people in the industry. Um, you will go to different conferences that are mainly just for financial professionals, and you just have such a love for for this business. And I remember reaching you, you reached out to me on LinkedIn and just shared a little bit of your story, bought, bought uh, Dan and I dinner uh, when you came out to Colorado. And ever since you've been a great friend. And so number one, I wanna thank you for being such an incredible friend. And I, what, what would be a win in this conversation is just for the people listening to be encouraged through your action, through some of the aha moments that you've had. And I would, I would love for you to share as much as you're willing and open um, but again, if I ask any question that you're not comfortable answering, no, no worries. Um, but I'm, I've been looking forward to this, this conversation for a while. Oh, thank you. That's, thanks for that little background. Um, yeah, I don't, I can't explain it. I just have really been ever since I learned in like 2017 about this and started researching it, you know, the whole, um, the hand asset kind of concept. It's just, um, I don't know. I just, it's just something that just can't go away. I'm always thinking about it and. I mean, yep. I, I got a friend right now. I'm thinking of his name. His name is Jake, and I'm like, Jake, you gotta give me five minutes, yeah. Um, because I know, I know, based on his morals and long-term thinking, that it just fits. But, but it, so anyway. So, anyway. so why don't you? This is what I would love for you to do. Why don't you go through your background and and give people a little bit of context? You don't live in Colorado, um, and you also have a very unique context as it relates to business and investing. So I'd love people to get a little bit of that. And then what I want to do is walk through when you first discovered this. And I'm going to put you on the spot, by the way, and ask you to uh, describe a couple things um, because I okay. find that we learn so much from other people's viewpoints. And um, I, that's how I've learned is learn from just the different ways that people talk about something. Okay, just so for a snapshot, um, I'm very blessed that uh, my parents, you know, started a manufacturing business here in Michigan. And my siblings and I now are, you know, kind of the, I guess, the shareholders of the business. And I'm also blessed that we have some non-family leadership who runs the place day to day. And so for the last um, almost five years, I've been able to kind of just kind of say, I want to go research X. And, and then I can just go do it and I can research it. And and, um, and one of the topics has been high cash value, whole life insurance, one of the topics, but there's been several other topics, but this is one that definitely has, has, um, has staying power. And it's, you know, once I felt comfortable and confident in it, you know, been able to, I guess, share it with my family and parents and siblings and nieces and nephews and friends and colleagues. And, um, but so our main thing is we have a manufacturing company and, I spend a lot of my time now researching and looking for in investments for our family. Yep. So you're, in a sense, you're the CFO to your family's wealth and, and you work in the business, but you're also 
trying to figure out other ways to multiply, keep, protect your your wealth as a family. Yeah, I yes, and I I mean I'm again I want to be very I just it feels feel strange to say that, but but yes, I I think I I'm managing a humble family office. Yeah. I guess you could say I. Yeah, you're, you're very humble and you don't have to be, but yes, I, w- I would say that would be a, an accurate statement. So um, in what, what were you, what was your mindset pre, you know, finding out cash value life insurance? Like, was it, was it real estate? Were you into alternatives? What was the mindset of, uh, cause you're very smart. Your, your mind's always going, you have a very, I don't know if you have an engineering background, but you very much think like an engineer, which by the way is a compliment, but not so much sometimes. Um, but what, what were you thinking before you stumbled upon this and what was your investing philosophy? Well, I was before 2016. I mean, all I really knew about was a uh, 401k and kind of a uh, stock market and mutual funds. Um, I was raised, you know, like having a tax liability is a blessing. Yeah. Like that's kind of how I was raised, you know, like if the business is profitable and we owe taxes, then we're fortunate, which is, is true, which is very true. But um, being kind of being freed up from my day-to-day job at Orbit Form back in 2017, I've been able to just learn a lot about tax efficient, Cash flow investing, um, and 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 that in that kind of arena, but I just wasn't exposed to pre 2016 2017. Um, since 2017, you know, really big focus is um, like I mentioned, you know, tax efficient, cash flowing, um, being able to uh, use leverage and pull your money out of investments and keep the equity and redeploy it somewhere else. You know, I mean, it's not rocket science, but it's just, it's not something that you learn naturally, I guess. Yeah. Well, would you, would you say that through this journey, your, you, your eyes got open to the efficiency? Like there's, there's, you know, the basics of investing is you're putting some kind of resource and hoping for some kind of result. But then when you, when you start going into that, it's like, wow, you can create efficiencies across that whole process and, and double of tri- and triple the result may, and it might not be by taking a triple risk, you know, it's like, so it's like, would you say that in that journey, you've, your, your eyes got open to efficiency or is there any, anything else that would like really, you know, intrigued you that, that you went down this path? Well, efficiency is certainly one of the aha moments I had when it came to um, high cash value whole life insurance, you know, and, and I know it's not as simple as your money working in two or three places at once, but in a lot of ways it actually is. Uh, um, and then I think that's corollary to, you know, if you can buy an asset and if you can, um, you can raise the value and you can refinance it and you can keep your equity and then you can roll over that refinanced that in something else. I mean, that, that's, it is very efficient. Um, and really the key thing I think is just having either having the skill set to handle those investments yourself or finding operators that you trust and believe in that you want to you know, kind of hand your hand your capital yeah. i love it so why don't you why don't you walk us through the process of you learning this and 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 kind of what some of the key resources that you leaned on and some of the epiphanies and what so what i'm going to do is just kind of give you the microphone and if someone was to say like you said your friend hey five minutes talk to me about this epiphany i would be curious what you would say in that time Okay, okay. Feel free to keep me on track if I get a little bit off course. Um, well, to be honest, I believe I heard some comments about um, infinite banking and other phrases like on podcasts and things. They were like, at first they were pretty much advertisements. It seems like nowadays there's more content that is just people sharing, not necessarily advertising. But um, back in like 2017, there's a couple ads. And again, because I think because I have a curious mind and, um, and I had time, I was blessed to have time, I was able to kind of research this stuff. Mm-hmm. I honestly, this is, I, I haven't told this for many years probably, but I actually avoided Nelson Nash's book, Becoming Your Own Banker, because I kept getting referred to it. And I feel like I have some experiences in life where I don't want to drink the Kool-Aid. 
right? And then when I, and then, so just to fast forward, I read that like a year after I even started my first set of policies. And when I read it, it was just like, wow. Like, like talk about bringing things together. Um, but early on in 2017, um, I really didn't have a, I had a lukewarm attitude about life insurance. Like, like I had some here at Orbit Forum. We I had like a, a whole life policy that I was going to invest in over a certain amount of years, and but it but it but it wasn't anything I would ever think about you know using, you know, it was just a protection feature. And um, I remember talking to my dad about life insurance, and he was he was kind of also kind of lukewarm. But but I mean these are some of these things are so interesting, Caleb. I remember once we were convinced that we wanted to try this, he says, David, you know what? My life insurance advisor from, from Northwestern Mutual, like every year for 20 years would call me and say, he'd say, Mike, that's my dad's name, Mike. He'd say, Mike, we need to get together and talk about more ways that you can be using your, your life insurance. And my dad would always, you know, no, thank you. You know, I'm good, got, got, got life insurance, you know. And now he looks back at that and he's like, wow, I wonder if Pete was trying to, you know, share some bigger picture ideas with me, you know, back in the day even. Um, so, you know, just researching and learning about the, um, the banks and how banks own so much life insurance. I, I spent a lot of time researching the life settlement industry. And We've actually, our family has made some pretty significant investments in life settlement funds. Right. And, and, just, awesome. and just so everyone listening or, or watching this, life settlements is you investing in other people's life insurance, death benefit. And a lot of times they are, you know, universal life policies that aren't designed for cash accumulation. And you have someone who's on the hook with potentially big premiums, but does is running, like, doesn't really want to pay that. But the death benefit would be best to keep, and so in a in a in a not twisted way, but in, in a quite brilliant way, you can create a win-win scenario where you pay that person more than the premium, so that they get some value up front, and then also get a portion or all of the death benefit when that person it's called in the life settlement business matures mm -hmm. um, but passes away, and so it's a it's a way to have very little to no market correlation and and still get a potential rate of return um it's also highly regulated um but yes i just wanted to give context it's a it's a brilliant brilliant investment for some people and, and I, got, I know this is kind of taking the long way around but i think you want that like, yeah. so i wasn't i was tangentially aware of this infinite banking concept i cash pay life insurance thing and it was kind of in the side but i was focusing on life settlements. And so I learned a ton about the life insurance industry and how strong these um, life insurance carriers are and and how how, how there's some really um, strong, I hate to say the word government, but regulatory protections in place to um, protect policyholders and beneficiaries. And and then I just felt like, man, if this is a this life settlement investment is just a super non-correlated um, safe place to earn a decent return yep. and um and like a lot of things back in 2016-17 it, it still isn't talked about a ton but the, the returns are coming down because there's more and more interest in the space but so that's that's what got me to understand how powerful life insurance companies were mm. okay and and also i learned how um pension funds and sovereign wealth funds and banks I mean, owned, bought these life settlements. And it's like, okay, oh, and Warren Buffett. I mean, it's just, you know, and these people, I mean, they know something that, that I had never been exposed to. So that kind of got me understanding how powerful and strong and secure life insurance was in general. And then um, and I just kind of, I think I just kind of turned my attention back to the uh, infinite making concept world or the and asset world. And, um, and here's 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 what happened. Um, I read a, a book. Um, I, it's like I mean, I'll, I'll get the book. It's right here. Yeah. Well, here's a. 
Here's a this is the end of that book. Um, yeah, that's right. But this book right here um, is called The Secret Asset. Yeah. And I'm reading this, and I'm like, remember, I'm. What's crazy is the key characters are Big Mike. That's and my dad's name is Mike, and everybody calls him Big Mike. Hmm. And the protagonist of the book is David, who is like the next generation who is learning about how to yeah. deploy life insurance for their family. Yeah. And I'm like, what the heck? So, so here's what happened. I'm like, I'm like, Dad, we've already decided to invest a lot of money in life settlements. We're just buying our own life settlements yeah. with life insurance and with, with, higher, with higher returns. And maintaining control with better tax benefits. Exactly. So it was like, I'm looking at these charts of life insurance, and I'm mm -hmm. like, well, this is exactly like the charts I was looking at for life settlements, but this has higher margins. Yeah. There's, there's so, no middle person. So, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to recap, because I, I actually <laughs> was not expecting this, but I love that you're going down this road. So life settlements, we, we talked a little bit about that, but you were looking at that as an investment. And, and just to recap on that, it's to put your money, buy other people's life insurance policies, and when they mature, you get a payout, not correlated to the market in, in a lot of cases. And again, I don't know if I have to say this as a disclaimer, not giving any investment advice, don't sue David or I, um, but in, in a lot of cases, um, over 10% re return. And, and depending on how they're structured, you, it's not necessarily tax-free then. Um, no. No. And, and so what you were saying is like, it's still great. It's not correlated to the market. It's you it's it's this is kind of where it gets a little weird is people take a medical test and the and the good candidates are the ones that are not healthy and so it's just like you know it's it's one of those things where it is a little bit inter you do have to like open your eyes to get even into this investment um but then you were you were looking at you know life insurance itself and your eyes went, you you turned on cuz you're like this is the life settlements on steroids because and we're going to get into the family legacy banking concept but you so you're essentially saying well, instead of putting this money into just for a future payout we can put our money towards an asset that will give us a future payout i love that you're thinking long term by the way that's tax free but then also you get to maintain control of that capital i.e the infinite banking the and asset concept of saying what what's all the other benefit that you can do when before the maturity and you're you're saying better returns, i.e., better returns as a, and it relates the the death benefit, but better returns, I would say, through the activity of controlling your capital as well. For sure, that's yeah, amazing. Yeah, I mean, I, that's that I'm th I'm grateful that you articulated that because no one on this show has articulated that view of life insurance, and I think it's a it's a powerful view. Well, good, good. So I I feel like I was going a little bit tangent there, but um, yeah, so. But yeah, then when you start, there's a couple other things, I guess, that really, um, you know, that really kind of hit home. I mean, I, I just feel like when you look at a, a, a good place to put your savings, mm -hmm. um, and then if you have a long-term mindset and you care about other people, you care about the future, um, and then I believe if you look at the possible things that can happen in life, yeah. Good and bad. I think a lot of us don't put, I mean, we don't want to think about the bad things, but we don't, I don't think we put um, enough, maybe pro, there's these things that aren't very probable, but if they happen, they're extremely volatile and very challenging. And so if you take a low probability with super huge impact, those things should be factored in. So you factor in somebody losing a job, getting sick, passing away, you know, getting a divorce. I mean, whatever, these things that if they're not maybe that probable, but when, if they do happen, they're really impactful. And I feel like by saving your money and building like an opportunity, an emergency fund based on the cash value of your, you know, and asset, um, I think it really helps um, yeah. prepare for some of those things that we don't think about, but that are going to happen. Yeah. Um, that's another big piece of this pie um, in my mind. So I want to ask you, I want to ask you this. Um, when, when I talked to Jason Sanger at Wealth Building Cornerstones, he talked about him studying a lot of pension funds 
And he's like, oh, if you actually discover, like if you look inside of a pension fund, there's there's different economic powers that are going on. Was that a part of your research at all? Did you look at like what pension funds and what even annuities were made of? And you're like, and did you did you identify that there were actuarial invest or not investments, yeah. actuarial products and investment? And was that because you you said like the sovereign pension funds, or did you learn that kind of after the fact? Because I think from someone who's very much in in the role that you were, on a concept of a family pension is also, I mean, that's what you guys are building is. Mm is also really key. Did that come up in any of your research? It did. It did. I remember several times being like, wow, so these companies, when they used to create pensions for their employees, they would write checks to life insurance companies. And I'm like, this is crazy. And then when you think of like the executives, even today, they're not, they're not basing their future on their 401k. They're getting their bonuses. They're getting their long-term compensation by the company giving money life insurance companies <laughs> to then to then build, like you said, an annuity-like product. Or it, it might just be life insurance based, but some of them are annuity based. And the life insurance companies are the entities that handle these. And it's like, wow, why like why are life insurance companies so disrespected? And well, I mean, you know why. And, and I don't want to go down the whole incentives for Wall Street and keeping man, keeping um, assets under management and all that stuff. But but um, but it's easy to understand why life insurance is so disrespected because, because it's not under the control of a third party. And the other thing I'll say is there's a lot of people also selling life insurance that shouldn't be or way oversell it and make you want to take a shower afterwards. So mm -hmm. I will, I, it, giving everybody the benefit of the doubt, I think 100%, there's a lot, there's agendas going on. And and if you actually look at, if you if you want to play the pension game, major, there's people making pensions just off of managing your money, to be quite frank. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's it's their own pension plan. Um, but but there's also a lot of misinformation and education. That's why I'm so grateful that we got connected because you get it, but you've gone through a journey. You've, you've probably had some cringeworthy conversations with some people and 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 yet it's you have you have so much conviction and you're not even in the business. And I just think it's a powerful it's a powerful testimony. One of the things that we talk about is external rate of return. This is this concept of like getting the it's the result outside the policy that you that only happens because you you're set up something like you have a policy do you have an example i know you, you guys haven't been doing it for your entire life but do you have an example in the last couple of years that you have gotten an external return because you guys have set up your and assets and infinite banking contracts as a family yeah i mean i think the simplest things are um we've replaced uh my brother my sister and me have all replaced our mortgages you know, and we've turned them into like a family banking kind of situation. Um, so we know basically we've taken policy loans from some of the family owned life insurance and um, we've t bought out our mortgages from third party lenders. And so now the interest stays, stays internal to the family bank, I guess you could say. And then also um, there's been several investments that have been funded by taking policy loans where so basically it's a hundred percent leveraged investment um and you know it you just got to make sure you, you're confident you're going to get over that hurdle rate of your policy loan interest rate and so specifically the simplest one to and i think i emailed you some things on this but um I, there's this atm fund that i feel very confident in very fond of and to me it's just a perfect marriage of you lend it you borrow at X and you're pretty confident you're going to get returns at Y. And um, it, it's, just a, it's just a good marriage, I believe, for deploying um, collateralized um, policy loans. Yeah, collateralized capital, which is, which is huge. And just to, just to go back to what you're saying, if you're borrowing at five and that's the cost of capital, and let's suppose that you're earning 12, you, you're, that's not a 7% spread. That's 140% return on your investment because your investment's really the quote unquote five dollars for every hundred you invest yeah. and then the twelve the for the twelve dollars and so it's just that the how do you that that could be an efficiency in a stand in itself you get an and asset you get all the benefits of of a long-term pension 
and you have the ability to 10x your money, which comes with risk because not, you know, you could put your money into a X, Y, or Z fund and it could disappear. Mm-hmm. And so it's like, it's not, it's just with, with that, with great responsibility comes, um, well, I guess with, with great, what's the Spider-Man quote, the great, uh, with great power comes great responsibility. That's the, that's the quote I was looking for. Um, so really it's, it's the, like, that's, that's what we're pointing towards. And, and it's like, it goes back to you being your greatest asset. It's going back to what do you really want? And the conversations that we're having already in this, in this new year, people come to us and they're like, where should we invest our money? Where should we invest our money? And we're, we're just like a mirroring them. Like, what do you actually want? Yeah. Like yeah. what's important to you? And yeah. then it sounds so simple, but yet I think so often we get, we get caught up in the details that don't matter because the details might be, may or may not help you live the life that you want. Sure, sure. No, it's important to kind of try to consider your, your long-term goals and objectives before you act. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's for sure. Uh, what I want to, what I want to do next is talk a little bit about legacy. And I know that you've, you've have a whole family tree. And so I'm, I'm, I, can you share with our audience like how you're viewing this and wh- how many generations you guys are setting this up and like wh- why you did that in, in, in the beginning? Because you're really marrying your life settlement background with your infinite banking background. And I think it all comes together really beautifully. Well, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to articulate it, you know, that Um, succinctly, but basically we have three generations that are, we currently have life insurance policies on. Um, And again, my parents who were like in their upper 60s, they're kind of, you know, I'm kind of the instigator to make all this happen, but a lot of it is funded by them after they have believed in the concept and believed in the process. Um, So basically, I, I use the term exit Wall Street. We, we've taken, we've exited Wall Street <laughs> and we've said, okay, we're exiting Wall Street with these funds. And we've, we've put in place some fairly significant um, like seven pay policies yeah. for my parents. And we've invested that exited Wall Street money in pretty, in pretty um, conservative places more like, I mean, just a little more, just a little more than cash, really. Um, so that, because we know we got to fund these guys for seven years, because that's kind of like the, um, what do you call it, the overflowing bucket concept. Um, so we have that in place, and then we've set up, so, and then we've set up, I personally, my wife and I, you know, own policies on each other and our children, but my parents, have also funding policies for me and my wife and my four siblings and their spouses and the 12 grandkids. And, and these aren't like super huge, but they're enough so that like my daughters who are currently uh, 10, seven and three, like they're designed so that when they're, they're, when they're all 18 or 19, they'll have like, 75 to 100k of cash value and there it's substantial enough where they they'll have some like you said they're going to have some responsibility but they're going to have some power they're going to be like okay do i want to use this to pay for college or do i want to use this to buy a vehicle do i want to use this to start a business do i want to like and it's my job to help them learn what this means um but that's the goal none of this is to so here's the thing and the goal is that people within our family, they, they get access to capital by taking loans from the family bank, which is basically structured around cash value and life insurance. And the deal is we have a, we have a promissory note and a family bank contract for every loan. And, if, and we have a deal where anybody else like in the family can can say, hey, once a year, they can say, show me you're paying, you're servicing that loan, which we haven't, no one's done that yet, but if we can, if we need to, then we, no one's asked me to give proof that I'm servicing my loan, but, but I've agreed in writing that they can. And then if I'm not servicing a loan, I can't go get an next loan. So I, like I could screw up, I could screw up once 
but then I can't go get the next loan. And so it, I think it's kind of like the way the Rockefellers have done it. It's, it's, it's nowhere near as, I mean, we don't have a 50 page like family like story or anything, but, but it, at least we're saying, listen, you can, you can do things by taking loans and you might have more flexible terms and you might have, but if you're not servicing or paying back that loan, you're not getting the next one. Yeah. I want to walk, I want to walk through and just summarize what you're saying. Cause it's so powerful. So when you, when you talk about the waterfall method, three, three generations, seven pay, what you're saying is your parents have substantial life insurance on them. And it's so funny because a lot of people come, come to us and they'll be saying like, Hey, I think I should have life insurance on all my kids. And we're like, yes. And make sure that you're properly insured <laughs> because this whole thing, it's like, and, and let me explain why, because what's going to happen is not only are your whole family, including your parents controlling the cash that's in those policies, but if, and when they do pass away, that money is going to flow. And why is it called the waterfall? It's because it's going to flow to the next generation. And something tells me that you're going to have a place to have that money flow, whether it's an outstanding policy loan, whether it's a, an investment. I just know you well enough where I know that that's already being accounted for because that death benefit is a permanent tax-free asset to the family. And so that, so that you guys already, like, bam, right now, like, you could have some really um, bad things happen in your family, meaning, like, you know, people could do some really bad, terrible things and overall it, it will get taken care of in the next generation and so i just think it's it's such a beautiful example and i also want to just go back to when your kids are 18 having 70 to a hundred thousand dollars of cash value and and that's that's an exponential asset that asset is growing exponentially like it's it's cool because yes they they will have a lot of power they will have a lot of responsibility and it's just really exciting because the idea is when they start having children to continue that and you, you guys are essentially doing what the Rockefellers do, um, just probably with a, a fewer, fewer zeros, <laughs> but, but yeah. that's, it, it, it's your age generation's getting, going to get stronger and stronger because your parents, their decision is going to show up for your grandchildren's children. If that, if that habit is continued. And so I, I want like that to sink in because not everyone's going to be in that, that place, but like my family, we're two generations. And when, when I, have children, God willing, like that, that we will be carrying the torch and, and each generation will get, will get stronger. Now note that it's not a get rich quick scheme. It's not mm -hmm. like a, this is a fast, it's like, no, this is the foundation. And you guys are continuing to invest outside and you guys have already, you guys already have documents in place to make sure that people don't take advantage of, of the power that you guys are establishing. And so it, am I missing anything? I, I just, I, I wanted to summarize what you so beautifully articulated. No, you're, you've got it. And I think the point of it's not a get rich quick scheme. It's not a way to make your kids or your grandkids um, spoiled because yeah. they're not, they're not getting cash. Like, like if they want to get a loan, they've got to document what the plan is. Like I'm buying a vehicle and here's the pay down plan. I'm, I'm funding my school and here's a pay down plan. I'm buying some real estate and here's the expected cash flow from the real estate. I mean, I, I'm just taking over my mortgage. I'm already paying this amount a month for my mortgage with Wells Fargo. So I'm just going to replace that with a family bank loan. I mean, it's, it's, it's like almost like teaching us to have a little business plans every time we take out a policy loan. And, and now I, that's that's for the family bank stuff. My wife and I have our own systems, and that's that's a little more flexible. We use that almost like um, almost not as fluid as like a line of credit, but kind of like a line of credit. Like you know, like my girls' private school tuitions, we you know they're expensive, and so we kind of build the policies and then take loans and pay back the loans, and you know so you know kind of do some of our life financial management through our policies that we own that we're funding ourselves yep yep and and that's what i, I also want to clarify is when you're doing the family banking like your kids don't own the policy at this point they're the insured but i yep. something tells me that either a trust or you own the policies and so they're accountable to that even though they are the insured and potentially i don't know but potentially that will be hand like they will get ownership at some point in their life maybe not um, yeah, there's, no, there's no, a couple okay 
So That's you want to cool. hear? So, so last week, last week, um, December is when the we call them G three. G three is the grandkids, so my kids. So last week, I got three letters in the mail from Mass Mutual, and they all looked exactly the same, except one was, you know, David Shirky, care of Hazel Shirky. David Shirky, Kara, Nora Shirky, David Shirky. So my daughter, seven year old, like, Dad, why do you have three of the same letters? So we're sitting there at dinner. And I said, Hey, and for dinner, let's look at them. And so I'm sitting there with my wife, my three daughters, three, seven, and 10. I open up each of their, like, what is it, like the annual statement yep. or whatever? Yep. And I'm like, I'm reading off their benefit and their cash value. And, and I don't even think my wife really even knows what all this stuff means. But, but I'm like, I'm like, we're, like we're building this, so you know this. This is twelve thousand dollars now. We're building this yep. so that when you're sixteen or whatever, and you need to, well, they don't get it, but it's the same thing as like the the uh, the Tunnel Twins books. It's they don't get all this stuff, but man, no one ever. I never heard about Frederick Bastiat until I was forty, and they're talking about it when they're seven. We're talking about you know, and so it's just trying to build their awareness. And yeah, build we, we have a couple of clients that are doing something very similar. And one of the benefits, the external benefits is just like, it's making you be intentional with your kids and it's creating a system. I mean, it could, it could, you could do this with a savings account, by the way. Like if you're, if you're at home, you could set up an individual savings account and yeah, over 15, 20, 30 years, there'll be some differences. It's called compound interest, but overall, like the, you're being, those intentional conversations are really key. And and I just think you guys are doing a phenomenal job, and I'm I'm really pumped to to just see you guys grow along with the journey. I also think it'd be cool um, to have you on a webinar to our clients and walk through sometime, you know, the notes and stuff and your experiences because I know a lot of our clients. I already know a lot of the emails that we're going to be getting, and you can email me at Caleb at BetterWealth.com. Um, is like, hey, I want to do this. I want, and and you know, this can be very inspiring to people that are just getting started. And and again, yeah. this doesn't happen overnight. I don't know if you're willing to share how many policies you have, but it's more than one. I can I can assure you. And it's and it's one of those things where it's like Rome wasn't built overnight, you know. And so yeah. it's 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 um it's very exciting. And I just again, thank you so much for taking time to be on this on the show. Is there anything else? Or yeah, I, I want you to share anything else that's on your mind as it relates to this topic. I just think, even though this isn't like a totally scripted professional presentation, hopefully it just, like you said, it provides some sparks because when one of your clients or prospects asks you, hey, that weird guy mentioned a family bank, like you're going to help them fill in the gaps. Yep. Like you're going to tell them what that actually is. And and that I think that can be a very rich like way to bring this to life. You know, to bring the and asset to life. Um, you know, and then he said, "Why did he, why did he mention a promissory note?" Well, that might help you describe a tangible way of putting us to work. Um, you know, or, or the ATM investment. Like, like why did he say borrow at X and we returns at Y? And hopefully, it just provides some good um, tangible discussion topics. I absolutely love it. Um, you know how I love ending these these podcasts and it's the legacy question. And, and I think you're going to have a unique answer to this. Um, but if this was your last day on earth and you were with the people that you love the most, what would you want to make sure that you communicated in your life experience? Um, and what would you want your last conversation to be like? Well, I, I guess, I guess hopefully, you know, my family and friends have seen like an example of a, uh, person who's been willing to give, you know, give more than he takes um, and try to help people and um, try to encourage people and um, just try to help people. People have, a, a, people have a rough enough time as it is. And so, you know, if we can, if we can just um, try to be uplifting and just be loving, um, I think that's what I hope my children and friends do when they have their everyday encounters. I mean, like in the morning when I'm driving my girls to school, I ask them, you know, how are you going to help your teacher today? How are you going to help your classmates today? And they get sick of hearing about it. But again, it's like, but if you have that in your mind, it just, it just helps. Yeah. Extremely, extremely powerful, man. The Go-Giver is one of the books that I'm super grateful for. And it's, and it really, there's some deep concepts that it's covered. 
Um, but it's, it's this concept of just being a giver at heart is everything and, and really creating value in the world is where it all begins. And so thank you so much for creating value just on the show. Thank you for the legacy that you're living. Um, and thank you just so much for this journey that you're allowing me to be a part of. Um, I'm really grateful that you're in my life and I'm grateful to learn uh, because I learned from you because there's so many things that you guys are doing as a family that, you know, someday I, I hope to continue the family legacy on as well. So thank you so much. Uh, really appreciate you. And, and this will definitely not be the last time you'll be uh, in the Better Wealth community and sharing uh, because I'm, I'm excited for future webinars to come. Okay. Sounds great. Take care. Awesome, dude. That was good. That was really good. Hey, I, I, I meant to. I meant to say. I meant to make comment about uh, about Dan reading the handbook. I forgot to get that in there. What do you, What do you mean? The well, isn't Dan? Dan's been like. Um, you guys have your handbook, and he's been. Um, yeah, it's Aaron. What's Aaron? Yes. Yeah, we oh, have awesome. we have a lot of good looking that. guys at. Uh... <laughs> no, no, I. So I'm glad I didn't. I'm, I'm glad I didn't yeah. say it then. Yeah. I, I guess I haven't been listening well enough, but yeah, I've been. I've been uh, I've been enjoying the you know kind of the handbook you know being shared the last couple of days. Yeah, dude, and and just wait till the movie comes out. We have one more shoot day, um, but we got we were in Wisconsin for three days. Um, got Jason Sanger going to be in Pensacola. Like it's um, it's my hope is my hope is to lay out a just a bulletproof argument to why one needs to to have an and asset in their life. And it's going to be good. I'm going to address, I'm going to address um, people like Dave Ramsey. I'm going to address it, all of the, all the, the people like Dave Ramsey and Susie Orman and Ramin yeah. Seti. It all goes back to this buy term invested difference. It's our, you know, our, what is it? Art, Art Williams? No, Al, it's it, this concept Art, of yeah. um, buy term invested difference. It's, it's, it comes down to opportunity cost. Totally. Like that's where all the problems with the buy term investor is difference like all the problems with whole life insurance come from that line so it's like we're we're designing this and i'm curious what your thoughts are on this the cell phone okay the cell phone think about how many things that this does this is in my alarm clock this is my flashlight this is my movie camera this is my camera this is my game boy this is my gps this is my computer you get what i'm saying here yeah sure. there's so many things that this i don't necessarily get this because it's a computer replacement, mm -hmm. but that's what that's, you know, so I would make the argument that the phone is a form of, of efficiency mm -hmm. and every single person that has money has a cell phone. It's just what it is. We can argue that it's not a good thing, but yeah. the, but the reality is people, when people say, Oh, this whole efficiency thing, like people don't care. That's BS. People do care about efficiency. It's just, we're not doing a good job of communicating that because we all have cars and we all have cell phones and we all have bought into the internet and what do they, I mean, they're, but the phone is a great example because it's bringing so many things together. And what I want, what I want people to understand is we have to stop thinking about life insurance as an investment. Oh, we have yeah. to, we have to, I almost picture the end asset and, and like look at all the things that it, it brings it together and it enhances, but you may be a terrible person and this might, you know, not improve your legacy, it, it just because it allows you to have a phone conversation doesn't mean that conversation was fruitful, but it allowed that. So mm -hmm. I, I, there, there's some cool things that we're working on that I think are going to really bridge some gaps. And then the volatility buffer, the covered call strategy, the understanding pensions, that's going to be huge because I'm pretty much going to make the argument whether you buy into infinite banking or whether you buy into just this, this retirement, you have to think about the end in mind. Mm -hmm. And I'm actually going to push down infinite banking a little bit and say, listen, this is not for everybody because majority of people shouldn't have control because they'll bankrupt themselves, you know? And so it's just very much yeah. playing to the, like, I want, like, I'm pushing it back on you. I'm talking about results, efficiency, and I'm, I'm sharing, like, there's two types of people. There's people that seek control. And I think that's where true wealth has happened. But if you're just going to buy in the 401k, let's actually look at why you're doing that. Why are you investing to begin with? It's it's for income, I think. Yeah. For retirement, I think. Well, if that's the case, and shouldn't we be measuring the income instead of the growth? So, dude, I'm yeah. I'm I'm fired up about this. <laughs> no, man, it's I mean, I don't it's it is challenging though. It's challenging for you and your colleagues to because 
every person probably has a different hook and 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 that's why it's like man it just takes a little bit of time and a little bit of engagement to figure to, and, and someone people it might never hook and then you yep. just gotta say thank you have a good good day but uh yep yeah keep at it brother all right dude i appreciate you take care yeah, guys, take care Thank you so much for listening to the Better Wealth Podcast. It would mean the world to me if you could hit subscribe, leave a review, and share this with the people that you know and love.